Okay, everybody have a handout? All right. So, uh, you, you know, these first classes, you know, what are we going to do and why are we doing it? All right. Uh, we are going to do the life of David. And by and large, in doing the life of David, we will be in First and Second Samuel. Um, there's no way to get that done by Christmas uh, in a really thorough way. So I'm going to try to give you the scaffolding, you know, the big picture stuff, uh, so that you can understand uh, why the life of David is critical. And let, uh, let me read a couple uh, verses to you uh, that will help you to see why it's important. Uh, and we read over these. We tend to uh, read them quickly uh, at Christmas. Uh, and the reason we do that is because we can't wait to get into the eggnog and open our presents and we forget what the Lord is saying to us. But just think about this. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. The son of Abraham. Why? Why is that the most critical thing that Matthew can open with? Why is, why, why is that what he wants to begin with? And then the second chapter... Uh, you hear, you know, we talk about the wise men coming from the east to Jerusalem, right? You know, we get the, and then he says, saying, what were the wise men saying? Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? How do the wise men know that he's the king of the Jews and he's a baby? Where would they get that information from? Uh, and then again, down to verse 6, in, uh, they told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. This is Jesus. Uh, same thing happens in, in, uh, in, in Luke. Uh, why is he described this way? Of all the ways that you could describe Jesus. When people ask you about Jesus, do you say, yes, he's the son of David, the king of the Jews? Probably not. <laughs> but that's how the Bible describes him, and it's important to know uh, why that's true. Uh, Luke uh, chapter uh, 1, And behold, uh, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, and he will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Why? Why? Well, that's important to know. Uh, if this is how the Holy Spirit describes Jesus, it might make sense if we describe Jesus the same way. Right? It, it, it's like when we're talking about the Gospel. People say, oh, uh, do you understand the gospel? It's like, oh, yes, I, I, I love Jesus, and when I die, I get to go to heaven. And the New Testament, none of the gospels describe the gospel that way at all. What is the gospel described as? The gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom. It's all about a king. Uh, and if you don't understand the, the thematically, how the entirety of scripture is the role of a righteous king who will rule and reign his kingdom forever and ever. That's the beginning of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. A king created a kingdom for himself. Uh, and then he created a man, male and female, man, male and female, in his image and told them to do something rule. They were to be sub-regents, sub-kings, if you can put it that way. But they didn't do that. And so another king had to come to take the place of the Adam who didn't do it, the second Adam, Jesus. And the story of the Bible is the entire story of a king uh, who needs to come and reign in righteousness. Uh, and we won't understand that until we understand who David is, because Jesus is the son of David. Uh, so that's going to be critical. All right. So that kind of kind of shape it. So you ready to get started with this? You sure? All right. 
so God, uh, be, in the beginning, I'm just going to place this in the timeline before we get into uh, 1 Samuel uh, chapter 1, and we're going to see why in the world, in 1 Samuel chapter 1, uh, all this uh, promise of a king and a ruler, why it begins with a barren woman. Uh, a woman without place in society, a nobody from nowhere. Uh, believe me, uh, Samuel, uh, who will be Hannah's son, uh, puts Ephraim, where she is from, on the map. It's, it's, it's like she's from Abbott, Maine or something. You know, it's, it's, it's nowhere. Uh, so God said, you are going to be my representatives and rule and reign for me. And that did not happen. And so Adam's story becomes Israel's story. Remember this? And as uh, they uh, seek uh, to reign in righteousness, no one does, right? So God hits the reset button and starts over with Noah, the new Adam. One family. Because remember what the promise was. From the seed of the woman will come someone who will do what? Crush the head of Satan. You remember that? So the whole Bible is about tracing this seed. And you're going to see that this seed gets down more often than not just to one person. And the one person is always barren. They, you, know, it's, you know, if the promise is of, a, is of a seed, of a son, how are you going to get that out of a barren woman? Uh, and that's exactly what happens because God is always showing over and over again in Scripture that nothing is impossible with God. Uh, and so uh, it's not going to be human ingenuity that does it. It's going to be the miraculous uh, God who supernaturally uh, brings life where there isn't, where there's a dead womb, God always brings life. Uh, and so here's the story all the way down through uh, 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 after Noah uh, comes out of the ark he's going to start over and, you know he's very excited uh, and he has three sons but only one of them works out right that's Shem uh, and then you, the whole Bible is following then the line of Shem and as the, the line of Shem is followed uh, who is who, who, uh, who does Shem lead to do you remember Abraham and Abraham has made a promise. He look up in the sky and says, you know, your descendants will be as the stars in the sky. Well, if your descendants are going to be as the stars in the sky, that requires what? Fertility. You know, you're going to need a lot of fertility uh, to make that happen. You know, uh, this seed is going to come from, uh, from uh, Abraham's line. And so Abraham, uh, his grandson Jacob, uh, was... Uh, uh, renamed Israel from the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, and uh, do you remember what the promise was? Remember what you're dealing with. You're dealing here with a culture who uh, prides itself and only survives if there are male descendants because it's a tribal culture. It's an agricultural culture. So uh, uh, you have to have male descendants. And it's always the eldest male that gets the inheritance. But at no time in the history up until now uh, that we're going to talk about with uh, Hannah uh, has a, uh, the eldest male been rewarded with the inheritance. Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. Who is the oldest? Esau. Right? Uh, the scepter will not depart from you, Judah. Remember uh, the blessing? Uh, what number was Judah of the 12 sons? Number four. Now, if you don't think that ticked off a few people, it did. <laughs> it did. Which is why they're throwing Joseph in a pit and selling him, right? <laughs> Things are bad. So, uh, understand how we're going to get to Hannah. All these lines. Now, Hannah is also barren. We're going to read this tonight. But who else was barren? Sarah. And she laughed. And then had a son. But she had two sons, didn't she? Didn't they have two? Ishmael and Isaac. Which one did God choose for his line? Isaac, not Ishmael. Who was born first? Ishmael. A barren womb. And then every one of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, Rebecca, Isaac's wife, barren. Same problem. Rachel, Jacob's wife, renamed Israel, 
barren. Samson, born of a barren woman. We're going to read about Hannah tonight, who gave birth to Samuel, the last judge of Israel and the first great prophet of Israel. Hannah, barren. Are you catching the theme? What about John the Baptist's mother? Barren. You getting the theme? God brings life out of death. Uh, when, when humanity cannot produce life, that is when God steps in. In fact, the only way that spiritual life is produced is through the sovereignty of God who steps into a dead womb and creates life where there is no life. You were born the same way while you were yet dead in your trespasses and sins. That is the th theme of the whole Bible. And so when it's time for Jesus' birth, it's not a barren womb, but no human is involved beside, uh, as, as, as a male descendant. It's the Holy Spirit himself, right? And so the lesson is finally consummated in Mary. Humanity can't do this. Humanity can't save itself. It can't, it'll never be a king enough. It'll never be righteous enough. It will never produce the seed uh, that will bring the righteous king to rule God's creation forever and ever. That can't happen. And so God proves over and over and over again the entire story of the scriptures is a barren woman uh, gives birth to a child who is not the eldest, but it's the least among them. And when it's come, going to be kind, come time to pick David, do you remember what the line's going to be? Man looks on the outward, but God looks on the inward. David is going to be the least likely choice. He's a runt. He's, it's, it, it's the wrong choice. No one's going to pick him. Uh, and, and when humanity got to pick the choice, who did they pick? Saul. who was not of the tribe of Judah, and so they picked the wrong one. Uh, and God let it happen to, to create a point. God is in charge 100% of the time, all the time, in the beginning God, is the beginning of end of all your theology. And if you don't start everything that you think about your spiritual life with that phrase, in the beginning God, you'll always end up down the wrong road, 100% of the time. That is the beginning and end of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So, with that, now we come to uh, Samuel, and so let me begin to narrow the funnel down to how do we get to Samuel. When, when is Samuel born? He's born during the time of Samson. Uh, this is what we're dealing with, and if you remember, um, Joshua brings uh, Israel into the Promised Land. Moses is not allowed to go, is he? So Joshua brings them into the promised land. Uh, it took how many years to get there? 40 years. Uh, in what would have taken a month to walk. And uh, the first generation is all dead. They were not allowed to come into the promised land because they disobeyed God. Uh, they wanted to be their own king. And so the Lord uh, allows Joshua to take everyone into the promised land finally after 40 years. I had him walking in circles for 40 years. And he takes them into the promised land, and they start doing the things they're supposed to do. The, the 12 tribes end up with um, the land that they're supposed to have. They begin to drive out uh, the Canaanites uh, and do everything that the Lord asked them to do. And in that context, uh, things were going pretty well. And then Joshua dies, and the last thing Joshua says is this. Don't forget to obey the Lord. Honor the Lord. He's given you the Ten Commandments. Honor the Lord. Uh, but after Joshua dies, that's the book of Judges, uh, they do not honor the Lord. And what happens is they're in constant fights with the Philistines and everyone else. The book of Judges is about 300 years. Uh, and God raises up over and over again a military leader, a judge, uh, Israel gets into trouble by their disobedience, uh, and the Lord uses a foreign army to come and, and you know, smack them around a little bit, essentially. 
uh, and they finally say, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> right? The Lord says, all right, I forgive you. I'll raise up a leader and I'll get rid of these people who are, uh, are, are attacking you. And uh, those are judges. Uh, and one of the great judges, of course, and towards the end is Samson. Uh, and Samson uh, is the judge just prior uh, or during the time when Samuel was born. But this is the state of Israel. And again, there was no such thing really as Israel. We don't have a monarchy yet. We just have 12 independent tribes. And this is what things look like. He said, boy, things must have been going really well. And at the end of Judges, uh, it ends this way. In those days, there was no king in Israel. And everyone did what was right in his own eyes. See the theme? God is going to be king. And when there is no king, everyone does what's right in his own eyes. And so uh, Judges ends that way. And that's the time period uh, that, uh, that Hannah Barren begs God for a son. Now just prior to that, during that same time period, is someone else you know named Ruth. Uh, and uh, Ruth has a little bit of trouble because they're starving to death in Israel. And so they leave and then she gets into a foreign country, her husband dies, everybody dies. And uh, it's like, what's going to happen? You know, when the husband's dead, there's no children, right? So the promise of God is for seed. How are you going to do that? And finally she comes back, and you remember she gets married uh, to a kinsman redeemer. redeemer a kinsman redeemer is a, a kin who redeems all of the land and buys it back so that she can be brought back into the family. And uh, they have a child together. And the book of Ruth ends this way. Uh, Salmon fathered Boaz, and Boaz fathered Obed, and Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David. And so without Ruth, there's no David. There's no son of David. He has, gets down to one person. Over and over and over again, one person. So that's how we begin uh, the book of 1 Samuel, all right? So we're going to do the first chapter tonight because I want you to meet Hannah. This is who we named our daughter after. <clears throat> so everybody have their Bible? We're going to read it, and then we're going to learn a few lessons about Hannah and, and about how she prayed, and I think that will help us. Um, <clears throat> there was a certain man of... Er, excuse me. <clears throat> there was a certain man of Ramathaim, uh, Zophim of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, son of Elihu, son of Tehu, son of Zuth, an Ephrathite, a nobody. There's nothing going on there if you're an Ephrathite. He had two wives. Ding, ding, ding. Was he supposed to have two wives? No, no he was not. By the way, you have to learn how to read uh, all literature, not just your Bible. The Bible, uh, early on, you, were, you know, the Garden of Eden was one man and one woman. And people often will say something like, well, you know, all the Old Testament guys had two wives. Read the rest of the story. It always is a disaster. 100% of the time, it's a complete disaster. It's a train wreck. You're supposed to, when you read these train wrecks, say, oh, good, God's not blessing that. And he's not. Um, the, uh, uh, the name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Now, you have to read this like someone who's an original reader. That's bad. She's cursed. There's no one to take care of her. She's not going to have a family. Now this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, uh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. Um, by the way, when Joshua came into uh, the Promised Land, there is no temple, right? There's the tabernacle of the presence, the tent of meeting. And uh, this is where Joshua uh, pitched the tent in Shiloh, and it stayed there forever. In fact, it was such a permanent feature of Shiloh that uh, you're going to see later that uh, it, they call it a temple because it just stayed there once, once he uh, 
pitched the tent there. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her. You see, one wife gets the kids, but the other wife gets the love. This is, not good. this is not a good family. I'm just telling you. <laughs> this is dysfunctional. It's, gonna, it's not going to be good. All right? uh, but to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her. Though the Lord, and don't forget this, though the Lord had closed her womb. Now that's important. Though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival, this is how the other wife is described, not as like, you know, a family member, a rival. Uh, her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her. This is now getting real, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, because the Lord had closed her womb. In other words, she, you know, she thought, well, good, you know, I, I'll be able to bust her chops about that. And so it went on year by year. You know, you're talking year after year. Now, if 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 he loved her and gave her a double portion, you know, not to be too graphic, but they were probably trying, don't you think? But no, no children. As often, uh, as, often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she, uh, she used to provoke her. Do, do you love the distinction there? Uh, Hannah is a worshiping woman. They go to the house of the Lord. Her husband, by the way, is a worshiping man. He goes to the house of the Lord. And every time she goes up to the house of the Lord, to worship, her rival provokes her. So on the way to worship the Lord, someone is essentially needling her over and over again. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. She was brokenhearted about this. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her something that no man should ever say. Don't ever listen, men. The lesson for us right now, women, plug your ears. Don't do this. Uh, <laughs> Hannah, why do you weep? And why don't you eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? <laughs> don't say that. <laughs> I mean, honestly. You know, you just... Uh, I could do a marriage seminar on that alone. <laughs> After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh... Uh, Hannah rose. In other words, they, they had been to the tabernacle, uh, they had worshipped, uh, and she rose. And now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. So that's interesting, right? Because it's actually not a temple yet. What, what there is is the tabernacle in Shiloh that Joshua has pitched, and it's just stayed there. But by now, it's been there, uh, you know, a couple hundred years, 300 years. It's been there so long that it's just considered a temple. And this is a precursor to the, for the temple that's to come, right? And uh, so Eli the priest was sitting on a seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. Uh, she was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. Uh, so she's worshiping. It's, it's like being in the sanctuary. And I'd, I'd be sitting on the chancel or in the back. And someone is at the altar praying and weeping bitterly. Um, and she vowed a vow and said, O oh, Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. You just think about that prayer for a minute. This is a woman who wants nothing but a child. And she says to the Lord, I'll give him back. Just give me a child. And no razor shall touch his head. And what that, that's a Nazarite vow from Numbers chapter 6. Uh, uh, Nazarites would take vows, and they were temporary vows, uh, where they would not drink, uh, they would not cut their hair, uh, and it was a sign that they were doing something significantly in the service of the Lord. And uh, these were always temporary vows. Uh, and then when that service was, to the Lord was up, uh, they would cut their hair, and they would bring it as an offering to the priest, and they would have a, a peace offering, uh, and then they'd go drink. <laughs> they'd go have a party. Uh, but the time was up, except for a couple of people in the Bible who took permanent Nazarite vows. Samson, and I'll give you one from the New Testament, John the Baptist. That's what all that description was. He was a permanent Nazarite. Uh, 
You don't see it very often as permanent. It was always a temporary. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart. Only her lips moved and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, How long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, uh, but I have been uh, pouring out my soul before the Lord. By the way, if you're a priest and know the, don't know the difference between a woman praying and someone who's a drunk, uh, you might not be all the priest you need to be. And you're going to find out that that's true. <laughs> you're going to find out uh, that that's true. I do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. Then Eli answered, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. So he comes around a little bit. He decides he's going to be a faithful pastor for like you know, at least a couple of minutes, and not callous. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your eyes. And then the woman went away and ate, and her face was no longer sad. Interesting. They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord, and then they went back to their house at Ramah, and Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife. You know what that means, right? Do I have to explain that to everybody? No. All right. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> and then one of the great lines of Scripture, and the Lord remembered her. I love that. And the Lord remembered her. Uh, and in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. So this is the birth of Samuel now from a barren woman who goes to the temple and prays, Lord, give me a son. I'll give you that son back uh, if you'll just give me a son. Now, we're going to talk about the prayer of Hannah, uh, but think about this for a minute. You've been barren your whole life. Now, if, if you know what it's like, you know, uh, uh, it, 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 it's ter terrible. You know, it's... You know, Brenda, you know, we, for whatever reason, she couldn't conceive for the longest time. And I was spending thousands and thousands of dollars buying drugs from around the world, you know, that they were shooting into her and doing all this stuff. And, and it, she was heartbroken. Uh, and, it, it, you know, nothing was working. Prayer wasn't working. The drugs weren't working. I mean, nothing was working, right? And I remember she came to me weeping and saying, I can't do it anymore. I just can't do it anymore. And she quit. And then essentially every time I walked through the room to get a sandwich, she got pregnant. <laughs> the Lord, he just works that way. <laughs> I mean, it's just, you know, it's the funniest thing. That's just how the Lord works, you know. And, and, and but if you'd have said to Brenda, oh, by the way, um, you can have to give Nathan back to the Lord. Think about that for a minute. I don't know. You know, I don't know. So let's, let's see what she does. Uh, verse 21. The man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer uh, to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and to pay his vow. So this is a worshiping family. You know, this is a worshiping family. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, As soon as the child is weaned, I will bring him so that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there forever. <laughs> I, have hard, <laughs> I have a hard time getting through that. But, you, you know, she knows that she's not going back to the presence of the Lord without the promise fulfilled. She's not going to do it. And notice, she's not going up to do religious rituals. She knows that when she goes to worship, she's going into the presence of the Lord. That's something that you might want to think about a little more often when you're worshiping. Uh, you go into the presence of the Lord. That's why we're there. That's what we're doing. And so she knows that. Uh, and Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him only. May the Lord establish his word. Well... That's a better answer than the first one. <laughs> That's a better answer than the first one. But this, I can't imagine doing this. You know, when, when uh, Nathan was born, we didn't think we were going to keep him. You know, they didn't give him much of a chance. And I, I remember in the birthing room, um, you know, it, it was immediately a problem. And 
you know, a mother knows instantly. Uh, he wasn't responding uh, and it was bad. Um, and, you know, obviously things go downhill pretty quickly. Uh, and, you know, they rushed him out uh, and, you know, it just didn't look good and he stayed in an incubator for a long time and it was, it was bad and would go visit and pray. And uh, we got to the point where uh, we had to uh, pray that if the Lord took him, uh, he'd still be a good God. Um, and we made that prayer holding the hands of our physician uh, who went to my church and who was a Christian. And so we stood in that in room and we prayed that the Lord have his will, but that we would be faithful regardless of his decision. And so when I read a story like this, and thankfully, you know, we had a whole church praying, and, and, you know, if you saw Nathan today, the Lord healed him, and, and we don't know how or why, and we finally got to take him home. It was a great thing. But every time I read this story, I can't stand it. Because I think that I had to pray, Lord, if you take my son, you're still a good God, I will not turn my back on you, and you will be right. Whatever it is, I won't know why, <laughs> but you'll be right. And uh, it was a hard prayer for us to pray, but we held our hands uh, together and we prayed that prayer over that child and, and the Lord healed him. Uh, but in the same instance, Hannah's praying a prayer and she already knows she's going to lose this child. She already knows. Uh, and the father says, may the Lord establish his word. What a godly answer. What a godly answer. Uh, so the woman uh, remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. And uh, when she had weaned him, she took him up with her along with a three-year-old bull, a nephah of flour, and a skin of wine. And she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. Now, what is she bringing all that for? She's bringing the sacrifice, right? We're going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, and she said, O oh, my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who is standing here in your presence praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. That's a great line. Lisa, could you, uh, in the bathroom, with some tissues for me? Thank you. Uh, so let's talk about this prayer for the last little bit of the class, because you, we won't understand how God works until you understand that God works through barren women, nobodies that you've never heard of, not the high and mighty, not the religious elite, nothing like that. He works through the discarded people, not many wise, not many, no, thank you. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And you never understand that uh, more until you read these stories and realize what did it take uh, for everybody prior to Jesus to produce Jesus. <laughs> what does that take? You know, and, and you see that it was full of great sacrifice. So we're going to talk about this one prayer. Look at verse 11, because what I'm hoping you can do tonight, if you can't do anything else, once you know this story, and this story will come back over and over again as we talk about how it is uh, that David is birthed and how God uses him as a righteous king, even as his moral failures pop up and all these things. He's a man after God's own heart. But I'm hoping tonight that you'll see the, Hannah's lifestyle of faith and just learn a few things from this that you can begin to use through the grace of Jesus Christ to live more of a faithful life for him and pray more faithfully about the things in your life uh, as well. Uh, so first of all, uh, we have three things here, starting in verse 11. Uh, Hannah, obviously in her lifestyle, she prayed in faith. So we're going to look at some of those things. And then she responded in faith. And then she served uh, in faith. So let's uh, look at those three things. All right, first of all, Hannah prayed in faith. Verse, uh, verse 11, I'm going to write these down for you so you can get them. So the fervent, effectual prayers of a righteous man availeth much, right? And everybody talks about prayer, but, you know, do we pray in faith? 
in the way that Hannah did. And so let's see what it looks like. Verse 11. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no uh, razor uh, shall touch his head. The first uh, thing that she does, and this is going to look obvious to you, uh, but she turns completely to God. And, and that's going to be a little bit obvious, but it, let me tell you why I'm going to belabor that point a little bit. Uh, almost all of our prayers start with, if I just had a little bit of God, I could get this resolved. And what people are praying really is for a little bit of God, but mostly themselves. I can, I can get most of this done. You know, I'll drive the car, but just find me a parking space. Uh, you know, we don't really... Go to God and say, nothing uh, that I could do will overcome this problem. Nothing. And it's hard for us to say uh, what the scriptures say. Without him, I am nothing. Because it sounds uh, like we're being negative. But that's the only hope you have. It's not negative. It's realistic. Uh, if you want something to happen in your life... You got to let go of you. He, you know, you must decrease, he must increase. And if, and if that doesn't happen, you know, you wonder why your prayers weren't answered. And the Lord's like, well, you kept getting in the way. You kept getting in the way. You have to get out of the way. And so she turned uh, completely uh, to God. Uh, second, and again, this looks obvious, but you overlooked it. She prayed to the God of Scripture. What do I mean by that? You see what it said? She, how she started prayer. Oh, Lord of hosts. Well, what, what is the Lord of hosts? That's the sovereign God. The host, that's a military term. Uh, the Lord is the captain of your salvation. The Lord of hosts is his name. We've used, you know, you've probably heard the phrase, right? But that means that he is the king of the universe. She's not turning and praying to a marginal God. You know, a lot of people say, well, you know, I'm praying to God. Yeah, this is not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is the all-sovereign king of the universe. He's in charge of 100% of everything. And, and if you're unwilling to pray to that God in particular... You're actually praying to an idol at that point, right? You're not praying to anybody. And so she, she knows who God is. She knows that God is completely sovereign. And so she turns to him and says, the Lord of hosts. That's how she addresses him, to the Lord of hosts. And so when you pray, start your prayers this way. O sovereign creator, God of the universe, you created everything there is about me. And without you, I'm nothing. That's a good way to get started. That's a good way to get started. Uh, but she also prayed knowing who she was. She prayed knowing who she was. She wasn't, she wasn't blind to her circumstance. Oh Lord of hosts, if you indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me. Uh, and, and here's the problem. We pray... It, it, you know, you get the guys on TV, right? And, and, and they're always telling people to pray, you know, the confess it and possess it crowd, the name it and claim it crowd. Uh, and honestly, they have people praying to God as if God uh, is required to fulfill their demands. i got news for you. He's not required to do anything. Zero. Uh, and if you teach people to pray like, hey God, uh, I'm coming in this way and you have to do what I say because I came in this way. Um, listen for the thunder. <laughs> it's just a matter, you know, it's gonna, the rumble. You'll feel it in your feet and then, you know, <laughs> it's going to get back. Uh, no, she knew who she was. And so when we come to the Lord, we, come, we, we turn to God completely. And we turn to the sovereign God of the universe and we say, look, 
I've got nothing here. I, I, I've, got, I've got no game whatsoever. Uh, I can't do this. Remember me. Uh, I'm an afflicted servant. I, I can't solve this problem. There's nothing I can do uh, for about it. But having said that, don't forget to do number four. She prayed knowing what she wanted. Uh, don't try to be humble before God. He knows. He knows all about you. <laughs> you know, it, it, go to the Lord and ask Him for what you want. He already knows what you want, right? Ask Him. Ask Him for what you want. She said, I want a son. That's a big prayer, right? And she wasn't shying about it. It's like, she, you know, she was going to be like, well, you know, you know, just, I guess anything to do, you know, if you feel like it, or whatever. No, I want a son. You know, it's, it, and you just have to learn to pray that way. It's like, like, you know, I had that kind of prayer on Sunday night. Right? Sunday night service. No goes, nobody goes to church on Sunday night at the beginning of football season. <laughs> right? <laughs> and I'm thinking, you know, 10 minutes before the service, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm absolutely crazy. <laughs> so I'm driving and I decided to just ask the Lord. I said, Lord, uh, and, and I asked him for a number. I said, Lord, if you'll just give me 50 people on Sunday night to get this thing started, I promise that I'll teach the Bible faithfully and we'll try to start seeing what the Lord's Day looks like. And, 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 and 20 years from now, people will look back and thank me uh, that there was a Sunday night service. But just give me 50. And he gave us 88. Wow. wow. I should have prayed for 100. I don't know. <laughs> You know, what a mistake. <laughs> what a mistake, right? So pray knowing what you want and ask for it. Don't be afraid. He knows what you want already. He knows the desires of your heart. He knows everything about you. Pray for what you want. When I go into a hospital room, you know, I don't pray. You know, I pray the Lord's will be done, but I pray for God to heal them. I never not pray that. And the only time I have not prayed that is when the person said to me, pray that the Lord will take me home. And then I'll pray that for them. But I go in praying for healing every single time. <laughs> you know, that's because that's what I, I, I want to see happen. I want people to understand that the Lord is the Lord who heals. You know, he's the great healer. So, but she also prayed... According to God's will. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's really that simple. And, and so, you know, when Brenda and I prayed that horrible prayer that I'll never forget, uh, we prayed that the Lord would heal Nathan, but we also prayed if it is your will not to heal him in your sovereign goodness, if that's not in your plan, then give us the strength. To live your will and not ours. It's really that simple. But she prayed according to the will of God. But will give a uh, servant your son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of your life. She asked for the will of God. And and finally, she fervently, which I can't spell, <laughs> opened her heart to God. You know, one of the, the great benefits of my life uh, was growing up where I grew up. I have a lot of theological differences, but boy, those people do pray. <laughs> I'll tell you what. Uh, I, you see how she's crying out to the Lord? And she's, she is so fervently and emotionally praying to the Lord. You know, she's, she doesn't come with, up with some cute little you know, whatever, with her hands folded and this and that. She's praying so hard to the Lord that the priest thinks she's drunk. She's going at it. Pray like that. Don't be afraid to pray like that. Get on your face before the Lord and pray. You know, like I said, I, you know, I, I, I was, my, my father's a, a Sempers of God pastor, right? So, it's Pentecostal. <laughs> 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 and, and again, you know, we have some theological concerns there, but 
I have never in my life seen people pray like that. I mean, before the Lord, I, I, it's just unbelievable. And, and it used to bug me because, you know, they're very serious about prayer. And, the, you know, <laughs> I would come home at, I don't know, 2, 3 in the morning. You know, I was out playing clubs or something like that. And uh, I'd come home at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning and, you know, I was into everything. I really was. I was into everything. And my mother would be praying. And I would hear her praying. Uh, and she wasn't shy about it, you know. And I can still, I'm 64 years old, and I can still hear her praying. Save my son. Save my son. Protect my son. I mean, over and over again. And she wasn't kidding around. And she wasn't praying these quiet little prayers that I wouldn't hear. She was praying loud before the Lord, crying and praying before the Lord. You save my son. You protect my son. And, you know, I'm convinced, you know, that I'm here because of that. I really am, because I was not going down that road naturally. I can tell you. <laughs> All right? So those are the, those are the, uh, the, the six things that Hannah prayed in faith. So this is a good way for us to learn to pray. All right, now we're going to look at how Hannah responded in faith because the Lord answers her prayer. And, and when the Lord answers your prayer, the, you know, you're still in a relationship, right? You know how it is. You know, the Lord answers your prayer and you run skipping along and it's like, you know, you forget who God is. So we want to, we want to see, and we only have three of these. So she prayed in faith, and then she responded in faith. So her first response was what? Gratitude, right? Genuine gratitude for what the Lord had done. She responded in complete gratitude to the Lord. Uh, see verse uh, 127, if I find it there. For this child I pray, the Lord has granted me my petition, I made him, therefore I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord. She's absolutely grateful that this is what the Lord has given she, her. Hair, uh, her prayers have been answered. And you'll be surprised, like, well, isn't that a foregone conclusion? Aren't people grateful when the Lord answers their prayer? No. I wish that were true. <laughs> I wish I didn't have to point out that gra gratitude is that's the foundation of the Christian life. You know why a lot of people struggle with the Christian life? They're not grateful that Jesus died for them. <laughs> they, they just don't feel any gratitude for that at all. You know, he pushes you out of in front of a moving train and takes the hit. And you're like, oh, thanks a lot. Go on your merry way. I, no gratitude. But uh, the Christian life is a life of gratitude. Constantly aware of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. And she, after having her uh, prayers answered, doesn't forget to thank the Lord. She knows, right? Uh, the second thing is, she responded in faithfulness. It's like, well, what's the difference? I'll show you. The Lord answers your prayer. Are you, you, know, are you still faithful? You see verses uh, 21 and 22. The man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer the, uh, to the Lord the yearly sacrifice to pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, As soon as the child is weaned, I will bring him, so that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there forever. She's going to be faithful. She know, you know, the Lord answers your prayers. Like, Lord, please give me, give, give me a spouse. Oh, please give me a spouse. And then the Lord gives you a spouse. And then there's no gratitude. And then you don't respond to that spouse faithfully. Well, why did you pray for a spouse and then you decide to be unfaithful to your spouse? Weird. Creepy. <laughs> right? <It's> creepy. <laughs> It, it, it's that simple. So once her prayer is answered, she's not only grateful, she's actually going to live faithfully and do what she is 
told the Lord that she's going to do, uh, she responds faithfully. But she also responds generously. And, and, and that can get read over too easy, but you see what verse 24 says? And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and skin of wine, and she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. Now, I, I'd have to take you back into the uh, Levitical law, but that is way more than that offering was required. It's like triple. It's like triple. And she is going to come with generosity to her God. And, and, you know, and again, it's, it's hard to remind people, but the Christian lifestyle is a generous lifestyle. We're called to generosity. Why? Wasn't Jesus generous with you, <laughs> boys and girls? <laughs> Wasn't he? Yeah, I mean, I would call, you know, dying on Calvary a bit generous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's, you know, so, but when the Spirit indwells us, remember, He's conforming us to the image of the generous Jesus. And so generosity and gratitude and faithfulness become sort of warp and woof of how we live and how our personalities get restructured before the Lord. Uh, so we start giving stuff away. You know, uh, you, you, you know, you don't complain about the tithe when you're a Christian. Uh, you don't complain about the offering. She didn't complain about that. She brought three times what the Lord never required for that offering. Why? Because she knew what the Lord had done for her. She's not stingy. Yeah, go ahead. What I find remarkable about this is she was barren all these years. Yeah. The Lord finally gave her a baby, yeah. a child. She had to give that baby up. Yeah. It, it, it's unbelievable, isn't it, if you think about it? The Lord gives you everything you've asked for, and then she, he, she gives every bit of it back. Every bit of it back. So that actually is a great segue because that's the final three points. Because she's serving now in faith, right? Now she becomes. So now we're going to look at how she served in faith. And we have three things here as well. That was a great segue, Rich. I could have paid for that. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm not kidding. They, they, it's like a plant, right? But you know, I hate to tell you this, but they've proven this over and over again. You, you, I believe in a miracle working God, and I couldn't help, you know, and I believe in healings, and I pray for them, but a lot of those things you're seeing on TV are plants. You know that, right? All right. Uh, Rich is not a plant. He actually came up with that. That's <laughs> 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 <No, no. laughs> It's true. <laughs> it's true. All right. So she, she served God in faith. So now the Lord is it. You've prayed faithfully to the Lord, and you've prayed uh, in a way that Hannah prays, and now you've responded in faith uh, to that answered prayer. But you're not done yet. Don't you have to live for the Lord now? Yes. All right. So what are we going to do? Uh, she's going to. Uh, she first of all knows. How do you live in faith? She knows. Her offering came from God in the first place. <laughs> you know, this is it's funny. Pe pe people talk about, you know, uh, be, you know, they're reluctant to be generous. They're re reluctant to give to the work of the Lord. And, and, and the reason they're reluctant and it is because it, they have no consciousness that everything they have, the Lord has given them. It's, and we're going to see this in First Corinthians on Sunday night, which you will, you will all faithfully attend. Yeah, <laughs> but Paul's Paul's going. I, the Holy Spirit's going to say later in, in, in First Corinthians, "What do you have that you were not given?" There's not, and the answer is, you have nothing that you are not given. And so she knows that the very thing that she is offering to God, God gave her in the first instance. And once you get that in your head, service and generosity will stop being a problem. It really will. It really will. And isn't this the same thing that Jesus said, where your treasure is, there's your heart also. 
where your treasure is, there is your heart also. So she knew her offering came from God. But she also knew that her offering required uh, preparation and diligence. In other words, she had to make an effort. You see in verse 22 what it says? But him did not go up, for she said, as soon as the child is weaned. How long does it take to wean a child? Depends on the culture, but you're not, you're not talking six weeks. Right? You're not talking six weeks. So let's, let's just call that two or three years, just for the fun of it. Right? There's, there's, there's no baby formula in, you know, at this period of time. None. So say that was three years. You don't think for once in three years she said, no, no, maybe I just keep him. This child is at her breast for three years. The bond, think about this. It, you know, it wasn't like she birthed this child and then they come running into the birthing room and grabbed the baby uh, and, and sent, it, sent Samuel off to the adoption agency. She weaned him. She potty trained him. She taught him to walk. She did everything that you would ever do with a child. And she, so she knows that her offering requires preparation and effort. And a life of faith, folks, is not a life of spiritual... I don't know what you call it. You've got to work at it. It's going to take some pain, some guts. You're going to have to go at this. It's year in and year out. It's, you know, here a little, there a little... It's, you just keep going. He who puts his hand to the plow and turns back is not fit for the kingdom. Keep one foot forward. What did Paul say? I've run in such a way that I win the prize. Now, we, when he says I run in such a way as I win, win the prize, you know, he's not shuffling along hoping for the best. You, you ever run a race? It, it, you know, you see these kids run races and, 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 and then they cross the finish line and puke. Effort. Right? That's the Christian life. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You know, we talk about grace and it's true. But grace is what gives you the strength and the courage to do the work. So do the work. Hannah did the work. And it was hard work. Every day of her life she knows that that, that child she's going to take back to the presence of the Lord. Every single day. Finally, she knew that the offering... was based on grace. Now, every page of your scripture is full of the grace and mercy of God. Now, where, where, where do I get that from? Well, what did she do when she returned him to the presence of the Lord? She did what? And when she had weaned him in verse 24, she took him up along with her, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah flower, a skin of wine, and she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh, and the child was young. <laughs> what a, what a, <laughs> that line is so poignant, you know. You're walking up there with, you know, a little boy, a little toddler, and you're going to give that child away. But she went up and offered. Now, every time in your Bible, and when you're reading your Old Testament, uh, you have to understand uh, that the reason that uh, the sacrifices were offered. Uh, word is not because that God is a bloodthirsty God. What a ridiculous criticism that is. Uh, it was a physical way every year to show people who were not in the presence of God that there was a substitute available for their sin. And if they would bring the best lamb of their flock and lay hands on the lamb symbolically, all their sins were forgiven. That was designed to teach them nothing about the Lamb. It was designed to teach them that there was always a substitute for their sin and that God would always confer grace through a substitute. All they had to do was confess that sin and bring it to the altar and there was always a substitute for your sin. Always. And that was grace and that was mercy. And they knew it. And so that picture became Christ, who is the perfect Lamb of God, because we now come and put our hands on Him, the perfect Lamb. 
and he is our substitute and he takes away the sins of the world. And all of those lessons were designed to teach that God is a gracious God who does not actually hold you accountable for your sins, but always provides and initiates a path of mercy and grace and gives you a way out. What was the problem with the Old Testament sacrifices? You had to do them year out, year in and year out. It, you never could. When would there be a final substitute? When would there be one? And there was one in Jesus Christ. And when Christ came, he was the final lamb, the perfect lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And so no longer do we have to come year in and year out. And now you can see what a crime it is for people who say that they're going to go back to that foolishness. We're not going backwards. It's finished. <laughs> That's the good news of the gospel. It's finished. So Hannah knew this. Hannah knew that there was a place of grace and mercy and she knew that her offering that she was giving to the Lord was based on his mercy and grace in the first place. So just think about what faith in the Christian life looks like. It's a life uh, where you know that everything you have came from God. It's a life where you uh, know that uh, you're going to have to work a little. There's going to be some preparation. But even though in that effort and that preparation and that work, you know that it's all of God's grace. And he will give you the grace and the mercy to keep going on and keeping on and keeping on. That's the life of Hannah. And uh, that will uh, help us as we uh, see how David uh, goes forward in the future. All right, so let's pray together. Lord, we thank you uh, for the example of uh, Hannah's life, uh, but we thank you uh, mostly for what you have done, because in the same way you extended her grace, uh, we can see that you extend us grace as well. And so we pray that that grace will be sufficient for us. For Christ's sake, we pray. Amen.